Maven, an expert, an authority, a connoisseur, a specialist, a professional, a knowledge king, a rock and roll sports talker. Coons Ford of Security Boulevard is proud to present The Sports Maven with Bruce Posner, a no-holds-barred look at the sports world. Now, here's Bruce Posner, The Sports Maven. A tumultuous week in sports here in Baltimore. The uh, victory by the, the Ravens on Sunday night started it. The release of Buck Showwater and a little bit surprisingly Dan Duquette uh, in the middle of the week. And a uh, big day for Maryland today against University of Michigan and tomorrow the Browns. But to talk about the O's and the cataclysmic change that occurred, I uh, bring in the expert on the Baltimore Orioles in my eyes, and that's Stan fans. Stan, welcome in. How you doing, Bruce? Doing great, doing great. So, Stan, before we yeah. start, before we start on like where do we go from here? Reflect, yeah. reflect on the tenure, which I thought was fantastic, uh, fantastic work with a horrific ending for Buck Showwater. Uh, well, you know. Listen, one of the hardest things in sports is to uh, change a losing culture. And I think you you can't help but appreciate that Buck Showalter did, did just that. I mean, he came in, and i got to tell you, when you come into what he came into in 2010, August 3rd, 2010, it's almost like a hand-to-hand combat to change the culture in a clubhouse. And by 2012, uh, he had this thing heading in the right direction. Um, it's 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 really uh, what what I think where I think we're heading, Bruce, is that I think we're looking for more of a singular vision um, coming out of the warehouse. And I think what you had was you had sort of a Peter Angelos point of view. You had a Dan Duquette point of view. And you had a Buck Showalter point of view. And I think at the end of the day, you had uh, you had a little too many too many hands uh, spoiling the stew. Um, what what Peter's agenda was, what Dan's agenda was, um, didn't always mesh with uh, Buck Showalter's. And I'm not blaming any one person here. There's plenty of it to go around. But I think what the boys are doing, and we still refer to them, even though their dad owned the club about 25 years now, uh, we still refer to them as the boys. But I think these are young men that are, are taking the appropriate approach right now to uh, changing uh, the overall culture of the organization. Stan, have you had a chance to talk with Buck? I know you're, you know, you're not best friends, but you're certainly friendly with him. No, I'm I'm going to see Buckhead, uh, and I anticipate he and Angela will finish out their stay here in Baltimore with their Kids Peace event uh, late in the month. Uh, I think it's October 30th. Uh, I plan to talk to them then. Uh, if somehow they change their mind and don't come, I'll probably drop an email to Buck's wife, Angela, and wish them well. Um, we weren't great friends, but uh, he treated me with a great deal of respect, and uh uh, you know, listen, he was a pretty good front man for the organization for a long time. Yeah, it certainly was. To me, I mean, I look back at it, and when you're 47 and 115, there is no defense. There's just nothing to say when you have a record like that. Uh, so, yeah, Bruce, so, you know, it, it, it really even goes back to the year before, 17, when they started out 22 and 10. From that point, they went 53 and 77. So if you do the math, they were like 100 and 188, you know, uh, over two-thirds of 17 and all of 18. So there really isn't any excuse. Yeah, you know, to me, I think one of the big mistakes, of course, was the Chris Davis signing. I think somehow or another, I don't know what you do. I can't. $84 million is a lot, but this guy needs to be jettisoned. If they have to make a deal and give him $75 million or what, I don't know how it works. But yeah. th- this was a disaster. I also thought that, like Brian Billick once said, that after a certain amount of time when you're in the town for a long time, your voice starts to get stale. And I, I thought that maybe that happened to Buck. Of course, he had nothing to say this year. But one of the reasons I really credit Harbaugh for, like, uh, staying on top of things, per se. And uh, so far, 
the uh, Ravens are certainly look like they've turned a corner, but there's a long way to go. Stan, what's wrong with Jonathan Scope? He's not even playing. Uh, I mean, he pinch hits. Yeah, it's it's really a, it's sort of a sad uh, sort of a sad thing. You know, we love Jonathan here, uh, but when you when you look at his record, and I'm not saying he still won't get a, a decent contract, but boy, his his value has has plummeted. And I wonder when he's a free agent uh, whether his price will be much more in align with what the Orioles uh, would be willing to pay him. Um, Could he possibly think, come back? I think it's a possibility. I think it's probably a real long shot because they won't quite be ready to invest. I mean, I think he's still a six six million dollar player for three years, like so like eighteen million for three. That'll probably be a little higher than the Orioles are ready to pay. But you know his the flaws in his game are his own base percentage and his strikeouts to walks. If you look at those things, they they were precursors for what's probably happened to him. And I think he's probably really out of his comfort zone in Milwaukee. Yeah, it's just it's hard to believe how well VR it's, has played. I mean, it was you know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's uh, it, it's one of the sadder things that's happened. You know, all the other guys. Britain is pitching reasonably well. He's nowhere near the Britain of fourteen, fifteen, and sixteen. But at least he's still highly thought of by the Yankees and used in leverage situations. Uh, Machado, of course, is important. Gosman's important. But it's really uh, uh, striking uh, to see that Scope isn't really a, a major player here. You don't, yeah. see, you don't see Scope as a non-tender candidate for the Brewers yet, do you? You know, that's a very interesting question, um, Danny. I think that he could be. I think he could be a non-tender uh, for, for next year. You know, smart teams, if he doesn't fit in there long term, he's probably going to make $8 million next year. And I'll bet the Brewers are, pr- are probably thinking – we got better things to do with eight million dollars, so he could he could very much end up a non-tender. Big hit for Manny last night. I was glad to see, and uh, you know he's one for seven. He's not exactly tearing the cover off the ball, and he hasn't done that in, for the Dodgers. But they seem to love him out there. I mean, you know. yeah, they they seem to love him. He's he's playing much more solid shortstop than he did in Baltimore. Of course, seriously, after a five or six year. Uh, layoff of playing that position, it was a, a lot to expect. And I think it was one of, I think it was one of Buck's really um, lesser moves that he's made in in his tenure in Baltimore was that attempt to uh, sort of maximize Manny's value, and I think it it lowered the the entire defensive structure of the team. Oh yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, his move to yeah. short was it was. I mean, Beckham. I mean, you, take, you you turn two positions into into uh, deficit positions for a good while. And you know what it really shows? It shows how important J.J. Hardy was to to the good five, six years and how important a shortstop is to that thing. Well, Beckham at third base was just unbelievable. It's, you, can't, you can't even put words into what it was. All right, that's, <laughs> that's, you know, I know I got you for a limited time today. Uh, real quick, let's first start talking maybe your – top three or four picks to replace Buck? Well, I, I'm not going to go there yet because I think you're putting the cart before the horse. I think until you know whether uh, a Ben Charrington, a Doug Melvin, a John Hart, a Dan O'Dowd, or one of these much younger guys like the Baltimorean Emile Sauté uh, uh, ends up as the director of baseball operations, I think starting to try and guess who the managers are uh, is really kind of really inappropriate. All I right, think then who? That, then uh, yeah. let's go the other route. Who are the general managers in your eyes? Who are the leaders well, for it? Well, I'll tell you. Jim Henneman wrote a piece, and, and I I think what they're going to end up doing, Bruce, is I think they're going to do what what sort of the Minnesota Twins did. I think they're looking for a guy that's equivalent to Dave Dombrowski with the Red Sox, uh, somebody to be the president of baseball operations, 
but understanding that that position now means something a little bit different. It's more of a CEO position, and then he hires the guy who's doing all the legwork, and that's the general manager. And um, I think they're going to get that guy signed in the next, like, two and a half, three weeks to be that guy, and then that, that person probably will have a short list of two or three people that he would bring in as his general manager. My personal choice would be Dan O'Dowd. Dan worked for the Orioles back in the uh, um, early 80s on the business side of things. He always longed to be in player development, and when Hank Peters was let go by Edward Bennett Williams, he followed him along with Tom Giordano to, um, to Cleveland, uh, where he was became farm director in a couple of years, and then he got the job as general manager of the Colorado Rockies for eight or nine years. I bring, uh, I I think he brings a real diversity, uh, not a diversity, a a total understanding of what it takes to build uh, an organization from the ground the ground up. Uh, I understand that Ben Charrington. Uh, who you wouldn't immediately think would would be a guy that might be attracted here in Baltimore, that he would only want to leave Toronto, where he's sort of an assistant uh, there, uh, the former Red Sox general manager. I understand he wants a position like I, how I've described it, a chance to build an organization from top to bottom. And then there's going to be a host of other names you're going to hear, uh, you know, and part of that has to do with the age of who's writing that story. Uh, Jim Henneman wrote a piece where he mentioned Doug Melvin, um, John Barr, um, and a couple people like that. John Mioli of the Baltimore Sun, who's probably 50 years younger than Jim, has got a lot of people like Ben Charrington and Emile Sauté, um, Gary LaRoque is mentioned. Uh, there's a lot of people, but I don't know who an early favorite would be right now. How's Brady Anderson fit into this whole thing? I think Brady ends up being a little bit of uh, ownership's eyes and ears. Um, you know, I think that that's w- one of the things that could be uh, a source of contention for somebody coming in. I think anybody that's coming into this position, Bruce, is really, if they're a smart person who the club would want to hire, that smart person is going to look at what the the tentacles of the organization are, and I think that person has every right to say, well, who is this guy really answering to, and what's his position, and do we really need him? So I think Brady had a chance to make his case uh, to have a, a really substantive position, and I think that Brady, who's a very smart guy, I think he just ultimately, it wasn't for him. You know, you keep waiting for Cal Ripken to sort of be, to have been involved in the Orioles, and then you'd, you'd hear him talk about it, and he'd almost talk like a little like a child as to what he could see himself doing. You know, you really, it's a lot of hard work, and it's a lot of answering to people, and it's a lot of responsibility. And I think at the end of the day, Brady opted out of a major position with the team, uh, but I think uh, John and Lou, their friendship with him, they think he can bring something to the table. Uh, but I think that the next person will have a little something to say. Uh, but that next person, although they're going to run the show, will probably say, you know, yeah, if you want Brady Anderson here in that position, we'll, we'll work around that. It all depends how bad they want the job, I guess, in the long run. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, whatever. You remember back? You remember back when Dan Duquette was hired? There was a guy named Tony Lacava who was an assistant general manager, and he's never gotten the general manager's gig um, in in Toronto. He's still with Toronto, but uh, they asked him. They were in very interested in Tony Lacava, and he wanted a, a certain scout named Dave Stockstill. Fired. He didn't want him around. And Peter Angelo said, "You know, you don't really tell me uh, how to run things. Uh, that guy's staying." And the next thing you know, they brought Dan Duquette out of a ten-year banishment—not uh, an official banishment, 
but uh, he had been blackballed basically in baseball. So, um, you know, I wish Dan well too. I think he did uh, some some good work here. Uh, you know, people want to point to him as, well, they signed Chris Davis, they signed Darren O'Day, they signed Mark Trumbo. I can guarantee you that he was not in favor of any of those three signings, and that's an awful lot of money per year on your payroll. There's no doubt, but one, I think the biggest mistake that was made was he want, when he wanted to leave, they should have let him go. Because it, it ha- uh, totally, totally agree with you. I didn't view that as some sort of evil. He may have, he may have mishandled it a little bit. Uh, by not going to Peter right away, I think he thought it could be worked around. But I agree with you. You don't really want to keep somebody. First of all, you don't really want to keep somebody from getting a better position. You know, uh, that that was kind of wrong. Uh, and I think the club took this approach like, hey, when we brought this guy off the scrap heap, he owes us loyalty. Well, you know, in fairness to Dan, Dan had been out of making a big paycheck for 10 years and he probably had a chance to double his salary and get get more responsibility. Um, I don't think he was the right guy for Toronto. Uh, I don't think his skill set is such that he's a team president guy. I think he's a much better development guy. Well, loyalty goes out the window on the other side too. I mean, they you know everybody yep. thought he was going to stay and he's gone. So you know. Yep. There's no loyalty. There's performance, and there's money, and there's yep. a lot of things. So I think that was a major mistake. Stan, you know, all right. I'll let you go. Thanks for coming on. This will be continued. All right? All right. I'm sure it will be. We'll all right. talk soon. Tell all everybody right, about you. your show today real quick. Uh, 10, 10 to 12 at uh, pressboxonline.com slash radio, or you can watch it on Facebook Live, uh, facebook.com slash Sports. Uh, Craig Heist and I are going to do two hours. We got uh, Jim Henneman, Josh Charles, and Jim Palmer on today. And send my congratulations to Josh on his the birth of his second baby. All right, little All right. baby girl. Yep. Yeah. Take care, my friend. Thanks, Percy. All Thanks right. for having me on. You Appreciate got it. it. Uh, yeah, Mike Sosha. No. Billy Ripken. Maybe. Listen. I'm Mike gonna, Bordick? Uh, no, well, okay. So here's the thing. I was going to ask Stan before he got off the phone. I know he had limited time. That's but, the fun thing about discussing who the manager is. Well, here's the thing. It doesn't matter. It really does not matter because the Orioles are not going to be good for two or three years. If you remember uh, when the Astros did their teardown, A.J. Hinch was not their manager. When the Cubs did their teardown, Joe Madden was not their manager. Rick Renteria was. Bo Porter was the manager in Houston. Unfortunately, what you need is a really good instructor who's patient and doesn't mind starting his managerial career with a 60 game under 500 record. Maybe Dusty Baker as an interim. Listen, if you want an interim like that, I almost wish they kept Buck around. But I understand they needed it. They need a culture change. And obviously you it stands exactly right. It needs to be the the. You don't want to put the cart before the horse. You, I love his idea. Uh, we were talking about it with Terry Ford last night. A president, a GM, and then a manager. And I would love for there to be a, a veteran guy like a, a Dombrowski type, whether it be a Ben Charrington or a John Hart or a Dan O'Dowd. Any of them would be very, very exciting. Uh, but it really doesn't matter. I mean, at first when people were suggesting Bordick, reactionarily, I'm just like, that. that's ridiculous. You don't want to hire someone just because they're an Oriole. You don't want to hire someone out of convenience. Never managed. But the more I think about it, does it matter? Yeah, I, I mean, think it matters. I, I, I think w- what matters from a manager for the Orioles for the next two years is simply someone who can who can communicate a new way of doing things and keep morale among young players high. So if that means if that could be a Bordick, it could be a Bordick. It could be a Ryan Miner who's currently managing, I think, in Bowie right now. Right. It could be a a Gary Kendall who is who's, who's a manager in Billy the minor league system. Could be Billy Ripken. It could be uh, Ron Johnson who's been managing at Norfolk for for years and years and years. I, mean, I feel like that's been a potential. Uh, uh, under the radar potential for a while is that they could just go with someone who's actually worked with a lot of the kids in the organization because again this is a placeholder whoever's the next manager I would say there's probably a 95% chance that they won't be managing the next playoff game for the Orioles no I agree I agree and the, the whoever is going to be the next manager uh, has to realize and be willing to have a couple bad years because that's what's going to happen all right there's no maybe not but 
it just seems like it. All right, with that, we'll ha- head out to our first break. And uh, that first segment was brought to you by Coons Ford on Security Boulevard. Check out that inventory. I'll say over a thousand cars in stock. And my, go see my good buddy, Dennis Kalatis. A little and, ugly out there today. Go check out lunch. You know what Dennis calls it? Liquid sunshine. Yeah. All right, check go. out, get a little lunch. Whether you buy or not, and uh, have a good time at Coons. This is Bruce Poser back in a few minutes here on Coons Ford presents the Sports Maven. Welcome back to Sports Maven, presented by Coons Ford of Security Boulevard. Now, once again, here's Bruce Posner, Sports Maven. Danny, I know you were, weren't here the past week or so, but. Uh, you heard me rail against the selection of Phil Mickelson. Absolutely. All right? Yeah. I railed against it. Yeah. And you saw what happened. Well, this is what Mr. Cordiality says yesterday. All right? This U.S. team was fractured. I don't know if you've been reading about it. No, I mean, the, all the drama between Patrick Reed and, and Jordan Spieth and all that stuff. It's been awful. Right. And also Kepka and DJ. Right. I right. mean, it's pretty bad. So Mickelson says, I'm 48. I'm not going to play tournaments with rough like that anymore. It's a waste of my time. Well, if this was his attitude and they knew this going in, why in the world would you select him? I, I, I can't explain. It, it was a disaster by the Ryder Cup, the whole selection committee and Furick and playing Tiger four times. The guy wins maybe the most emotional win of his career. The 14 majors, you know, could have been 20 majors. I mean, he, it was natural to him. But coming back to win the Tour Championship, 100-degree heat in Atlanta, all right, flies to, flies to Paris right. on Tuesday, and then opens up on Tuesday in 50 degrees. The guy's 42, just got over an injury. He's played three weeks in a row. This was the most... Ridiculous. It was a setup for a massacre. I saw it coming, you know, and everybody was playing poorly. And I didn't realize the lack of unity on the team. Disaster. All right. It was a disaster. And if you watch the Ryder Cup and you don't think that Europe wants it more than the U.S., you didn't watch what I watched. I watched every second of it. I was up okay. two o'clock in the morning. Uh, on Friday, 3 o'clock on Saturday, and virtually, except when I was here, I watched every second uh, of the whole thing, and it was an, an absolute disaster. Speaking of disasters, Jose Mourinho, <laughs> back me or sack me. If you don't know who he is, he's the coach of the, of the, uh, the what are they called? Manager, the manager of Manchester, Manchester United. United. Yeah. And if Manchester United doesn't win at all, it's a disaster. There's no second place. I guess the Champions League title would be okay, but I'm not sure about that. But uh, right now, you got three, three muscle teams in the uh, Premier League, yeah. Premier League, and Tottenham, which is like a uh, a step behind fourth. All right, but certainly not a bad team. No. But t- tomorrow, I say this, I'm gonna get off this after after I mention it. <laughs> Liverpool, Man City, it's on eleven thirty. Here's the number that's unbelievable. You ready? One billion homes. One billion homes will watch Liverpool against Man City. Worldwide. Worldwide. In hundred and seventy nine countries. Don't ever think NFL football is the biggest. It's not even close. Mm-mm. Seven out of the top ten teams of value are the Premier League. All right? It's unbelievable. But, uh, wow. All right, Nick Saban, on another subject, oh my goodness. is chastising the fans for not showing up. I always get a kick out of that. Like, it's, it's the student's duty to show up. You know, in Maryland— at Maryland, Bobby Pinkter, a big a big booster of the University of Maryland, uh, put into a fund, a scholarship fund. Listen to this, Danny. Five thousand dollars a game, all right, for fans who are still there, students who are still there with like three minutes to go or five minutes to go. So you you put your uh, you put your card in when you walk in, and they select a person at the end of the game who gets a five thousand dollar scholarship fund. That's what. That's how strong he felt about uh, keeping students there. And guess what? It's worked. All right. 
the students are sticking around for that shot. You have to be a fool not to. And you got to be there. You got five minutes to come claim the prize. Five minutes. All right. And so far, the first two people claim the prize. Nice. I think that's great. I, I just think that it's... It's a little uh, ridiculous to have to do it, but I think it's great. I, I think that Nick Saban, while you want to roll your eyes at him for being the way that he is, I really feel like the Alabama fans don't mind. And I feel like th- that might be a, why he's doing it. It might seem like a very you know, cold and uh, curmudgeonly way to go about it, but I feel like... It might work because, you know, the Alabama fans are not about to, you know, turn on Nick Saban. So I feel like it's going to work for him. Listen, I bet they'll show up. There's two college coaches, I'd say three, who walk on water. All right. Urban Meyer. Nobody's even talking about what happened anymore. Uh, Nick Saban and probably David Shaw from Stanford. These three guys walk on water. They can't do anything wrong. And uh, that's the way it goes. All right. Tonight. 11 o'clock. There's no doubt about it. He's back. He is back. The bus wrecker. <laughs> all right. Now, I watched the weigh-in last night. Uh-huh. And I fell asleep. I watched the replay of it like 1 o'clock. What, did he do anything or it was nothing? I, I, I don't think in the weigh-in. It was, it was in the press conferences that, I mean, he showed up 25 minutes late and they got in each other's faces and all that stuff. I'm excited, Bruce. Yeah. I'm, I, might not, I might need to go find a place to watch this tonight. Is Khabib... Is he? He's legit. We know. Who wins? The, who wins the fight? I mean, it's very interesting. I think that because Connor's been out of the octagon for so long, I feel like people are going to want to think Khabib will come through. Connor has a very, unless he's facing a Diaz brother, he he has a very very good track record for coming up and and silencing doubters. I think it might be better for the UFC if Khabib wins, and then they can have the uh, the rematch. But. Uh, I'm. I'm really. I don't think I care who wins this match. Do you? I mean, I think it's. It's just happy to see Connor back. I in like the ring. to see. I don't even know who Khabib is, but I know that he's good, yeah. and I know I like to see him win. I think it's fun to watch Connor lose. But Connor loses like a gentleman. I'll give it to him. Yeah. You know, when when he lost, well, he knows he's getting paid. <laughs> when he lost to Mayweather, all right. Well, he couldn't believe they stopped the fight. He said, "I wanted them to carry me out of the ring. I got beat so bad." I don't want to be have he it got stopped. One hundred and fifty million dollar payday. For There's that. no losers, <laughs> right? There's no losers He's whatsoever. Not at all. Yeah. Uh, I my pick to win the fight for some reason is Conor McGregor, and I don't know enough about it except he's a bad dude. All right, he really is. And if you look at the shape he's in, I don't think it's conceivable to be in better shape than he is in. And it's hard to believe in some cases that he's not on the uh, he's not on the juice when you look at his body. You know, how much how much this is a lightweight fight, Danny? Uh, it's I, I might need to look at it. Light heavyweight, I'm pretty sure. What do they weigh? What does Connor weigh? I'll get that for you. All right, we'll check that out. But <laughs> you know, these guys. The, I, I saw some guy a 130 pound weight class. He yeah. looked like he weighed 190. All right, he was ripped so well. But uh, you know, it should be great. Can't wait to watch it. And of course, then tomorrow. The Ravens, the rebirth of the Ravens. One fifty four and a half. One fifty four. That's like a middleweight. Yep. So I don't know what they what they call it in UFC. And UFC is so there's so much now. What's the other one? Bellator. Yes. What is Bellator? Bellator is owned by Paramount and CBS. It's basically just a uh, the WCW to the WWF of MMA. They they actually have a little bit better production values because they have a conglomerate like. Uh, it's very much like WCW. How Turner owned WCW. Right. It's very much like how, how uh, Paramount and so what is owns. What does Dot Zone cover? Do are you familiar with that? Yes. Uh, I mean, Dot Zone is is basically any combat sport website. Uh, does it include UFC? Yeah, it does. Because for nine dollars a month, that's pretty cheap. Yeah. And how uh, much is the fight tonight? You think eighty, seventy nine? I, I I think it's sixty nine ninety nine or seventy nine ninety nine, depending on whether or not you're watching it in HD. It's still amazing how they still tear that. Um, I'm watching it at a bar. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to worry about buying that at home. I'm, I'm sure I'm, most bars have right, it. Right. And, yeah. and I'm excited for it. It's going to be a good fight. Well, I'm going over to Dennis's to watch it. Very so, nice. You know, he has one of those packages where he gets it all. All right. With that, we'll head out to break number two. This is Bruce Posner. Going to bring in my uh, college football expert at the, next to talk about Maryland football today. Take a look at the Ravens tomorrow. Do some predictions on some college games today. Be interesting. Uh, does Maryland have a chance today? I, I don't see it, but you never know. 
You never know. I mean, Michigan had to go to the wire to defeat uh, Northwestern. Who don't uh, look like Northwestern has for the last couple of years. Right. So far, and so. Michigan, their offense is very suspect. All right. It's very, very suspect. What do you suspect. think this means for Harbaugh? If, if, I mean, like, I'm not trying to, like, bring the Terps down, but don't you think that would be a big bruise? Oh, to my God. Are you Harbaugh? kidding me? Losing to Maryland? That's what I'm saying. Wow. Not if he won every other game the rest of the year, but be honest with you, if it was at Maryland, I think they'd have a chance. Right. But they're only 17 point underdogs. Now, they, I say only. only right. <laughs> when Maryland went to Texas last year, they were 19 point underdogs. And look what Maryland's done to Texas season. If Texas would have beat Maryland and be undefeated right now, the Red River shootout, or now they call it the showdown. Right. Is that because of the gun yeah, thing? Yeah, yeah probably. Okay. The Red <laughs> What I'm telling you, the rivalry of Oklahoma and Texas, the Red River Shootout is maybe the yes. best name yeah. rather than the Iron Bowl. But the thing is, to be fair, I mean, I I know it was called that for a long time. I haven't heard it called the shootout on ESPN in years. It was always called the Red River Rivalry. They, 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 All right. do, they, they do the triple. Where did I get so. shootout from? It probably was called that when when you were a kid when 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 there was guns on TV yeah. <laughs> when when the when there were basketball teams called the bullets no when the game mattered right all right it used to matter right. well today it matters right you got undefeated Oklahoma against uh, one loss Texas and if Texas wins this game it means a lot for Maryland it sure does it really means a lot for Maryland to put that uh, game in our win column. They're like we did early in the year. And I don't think Texas will be scheduling us again. With that, we'll have to break number two. This is Bruce Poser. You're listening to Coons Ford Presents a Sports Maven. Back in a few minutes here on CBS Sports Radio 1300. This is the Sports Maven Show. Presented by Coons Ford of Security Boulevard. Now, here's the Maven himself, Bruce Posner. So, a big game today against the uh, against Michigan. Uh, Maryland goes up to the big house. Uh, it would be a marquee win. Maryland beat Michigan a few years back up there under Randy Etzel. Do you remember that? Yeah. What was the name of that coach? He wasn't too successful. Mason will know. Mason, y'all, y'all, you Brady hear? Brady Hoke? Hoke, yeah. yeah. Brady Hoke. Brady, Brady Hoke. He was a disaster, wasn't he, Mason? An absolute disaster, but hey, uh, now they're talking about how Harbaugh has is only one game better than Brady Hoke since those first few successful You're years. Kidding You're kidding me. You're kidding me. That's it. So when Brady Hoke came to Michigan, they were like 10-2 and two and then 11-1. and one. Harbaugh has the same thing. Since then, Harbaugh is only one game better than Brady Hoke. <laughs> That's unbelievable. That is really unbelievable. Uh, listen, Danny, I don't know if you were listening. Danny asked me a question. What impact would it have on Harbaugh if somehow or another Maryland won today? Well, I did hear Danny uh, say that question, and I think it would be really bad for the future of Jim Harbaugh. They already have lost the game this year that they expected to be a lot better in against Notre Dame in the first week. And now if they lose to Maryland, you know, it's Michigan. Nine and three is not going to cut it. Eight and four is not going to cut it. They have tough games left on the schedule. They have to beat Maryland today, or it could be the last season of Jim Harbaugh in Ann Arbor. Or the whispers would start, because listen, let's face fact, all right, unless something strange happens, they're going to lose to Ohio State again. I mean, they're... they're I mean, their defense, their offense is just not good enough to beat Ohio State. It really isn't. I mean, the only team that could have beat them, in my eyes, uh, was torpedoed by horrible decisions by James Franklin. All right, and that was Penn State last week. Some of the worst decisions I've ever seen. I don't know what he was thinking about on that last call, and uh, I, I still don't believe it. But that's another topic for another day so let's talk about how maryland has a chance this week what i mean i look at michigan's offense and there's not much to look at is it well at home there is michigan's been a really successful team at home with their offense but not on the road maryland is really the first team that's expected to put up a fight against michigan in ann arbor at the big house today if maryland is to win they have to be able to run the ball and michigan I really feel like it's if they play Ryshawn Gary or play one of their other defensive players that's injured. If Michigan tries to sit out these guys, they could kind of have that Maryland Temple effect and 
really miss them and then end up losing. And then after the game, you say, well, why'd they lose? Because they sat these guys because they thought they were going to win. And that looks really bad on the coaching staff. They should take a note out of what they've seen off of Maryland and play those guys if they can go. Talk about talk about what Michigan, Michigan brings on defense. They're certainly one of the top defenses in the country. Well, Michigan, they always have players, and they have one this year, plays middle linebacker for them, I'm forgetting his name right now, that they might not be the most athletically talented guys, but the way they play, they play so hard on defense. Now, on the other hand, they have one of the most talented players from two years ago's recruiting class, right, Sean Gary, he plays on the interior defensive line, right now predicted to be a top five pick in this year's draft. He's a scary guy to look at if you're Maryland's offensive line today, and a team that's based on running the ball, Michigan might not be the best matchup. Does They're going to need Kasim to play well, and that really there's your bottom line, Kasim Hill. The, uh, does the Jets sweep work today or no way? I'm going to go with no way, Bruce. Maryland, actually, no, I'm going to change my answer. <laughs> One time today it will work, just right. like last week. You run vertically, I mean, you run horizontally just straight up and down the field, and then you could hit them with one play to the outside. Now, when you run that one play or those two plays, you have to execute them exactly right. It's a big play kind of play now. I don't really think it's going to be back like that Texas game where you could run it every third down. It's, it's now one or two plays, and it worked last week, but will it work this week? Who knows kind of play. Well, since Matt Canada likes to take the ball first, which I wholeheartedly agree with, and Harbaugh likes to defer, it's a good chance Maryland will get the ball first today. I wonder how the, what the scripted series will be. You know, well, I mean, I, you've got to release Kasim to throw the ball, and, and yeah. it just hasn't been that successful, has it? That's what I was going to say, Bruce. Get some quick passes, get him some completion, get him in that rhythm. It seems like he's a really rhythm-based quarterback at this point, so... I would love to see, you know, a quick, maybe a tight end screen, pull something out like that that will just get them, you know, a completion that hopefully gains five-plus yards. Um, you take the ball first, you have to score. I know that's their whole thing. You get the ball, you have to score. That will be the same goal for Maryland on that first drive. You have to put seven points on the board. You've got to get out to a lead. Now, the other thing, and I'm not sure if you've heard this yet, is there is lightning in the Ann Arbor area today. It's supposed to rain hard all game, possible lightning delays. I'm hearing some things up on the fan board from some Michigan fans that say this game might not happen today because of the weather. Really? Really? Yeah, it's a 90% plus chance. Um, I'm seeing thunderstorms on the Weather Channel right now. But, yeah, but they'll just stall know. it. They'll play it. You know, it'll take the whole day to play it. The game's going to happen, in my opinion. I mean, I guess you could postpone it till tomorrow, but... Uh, I don't know if they'd want to do that, but that's very interesting. Tell me about the quarterback, Patterson. Not impressive numbers, although a good completion percentage. Yeah, Shea Patterson played at Ole Miss last season, had to fight all summer to get to Michigan to be able to play this year. He won the quarterback competition against Wilton Spate, who ended up transferring out to UCLA. He's good, but he's not there yet. He played one year last year at Ole Miss where he ended up being injured. Of course, you know, everything that happened at Ole Miss last year didn't really help him very much. Um, but from what I've seen, he can really run the ball, and when he gets out of the pocket, he's one of those guys that can just make a play. And today's kind of one of those days for this Michigan team where it's the same kind of test that Maryland's facing. I look at their receivers, all right, and again, I, haven't, I, I, I know the scores and everything, but their two top receivers only have 13 catches, Collins and Gentry. That's woefully low, or am I wrong? It is. They uh, played they five really games. Found, five they games. They really found that, that way to get their top guys the ball. Of course, they have the Swiss Army and nice Donovan Peoples-Jones, who they try and get the ball to as much as they can. But this Michigan offense, and we've seen it over these past years, every year we're saying if they have an off day, Maryland can beat them. And it's the same thing this year. They just play a really simple thing. All they want to do is run the ball and hold the ball for eight minutes and score and beat you, you know, 17 to 10. Well, they let you beat yourself, too, but they beat us pretty bad lately. All right, what are your prediction today, Mason? Well, I'm taking Oklahoma big today over Texas. The other ranked game, Blacksburg at night for Notre Dame. I'm picking the Irish. They keep it rolling. Ian Brock, I talked about him last week, 75% completion rate on the season. 
he's really given Notre Dame that jump they needed. Other than that, it's not a huge day in college football. No, you know, Texas, uh, I don't know about Texas. You know, I've been with them every week, and they've been winning, all right? And can they, first of all, with an eight-point number, I'd only go Texas, although if Oklahoma wins. Oklahoma's got a quarterback. Uh, he's a guy who was, who was beat out by Haskins, correct? And he left Ohio State. No. No. Who, who am I thinking about? You're thinking about Joe Burrow, who plays at LSU. LSU, right, Florida LSU, today. right. I mean, it's like now, if you're a top-line quarterback and you don't get the job, you just leave. It's almost like... I mean, yeah, I, it's almost like basketball now. Getting crazy. It's getting crazy. All right, it's, other games got picked. Northwestern at Michigan State. Very interesting, 11 points. Uh, Northwestern, 17 zip on Michigan. They could not hold it. Of course, that was at home, though. Yeah, Bruce, uh, that one is one that I would not touch today. There aren't a lot that I liked when I was looking through them this morning. Uh, Northwestern, I see them have a big letdown, but Michigan State has not been good this year. They do have a really strong defense. Other than that, not much, again, from Sparty this year. All right, what's your Maryland final score today? I, I, I'll say that I'll pick Michigan to win in the vicinity of, uh, like, 27-17. Yeah, I'll go with something similar. I will pick Michigan in this game. Michigan puts up 31, Maryland 21. The improvement is there, but we're just not there to the point where we can win on the road in Ann Arbor yet. But it's going to be a game. I think Maryland will be able to compete early. That's all I'm asking for. Compete today and give yourselves a chance to win. All right, real quick, let's talk about the Ravens. We'll preview our show tomorrow in the nest with Science and Kirk. Uh, Ravens and the Browns. Uh, I went to the edge. Well, I love that show. I don't know if you ever watch it with Joe Nobo. I think he's a Baltimore guy, and he really breaks down the game. And uh, he he sees. Well, I think everybody sees a Maryland win, but me uh, yeah, a Ravens win. But uh, Baker Mayfield's you know the speaking, truth. He's the truth. He's the truth. Speaking of Oklahoma, uh, he will move the ball against Absolutely. the Ravens. What do you think, Mace? Yeah, I'm actually going to pick the Browns in this game for him. You're entitled uh, to. Been- what? You're, you're allowed to. Go ahead. <laughs> I will take the Browns in this game. I think Baker's really got it going, and I think it's time that this Cleveland team takes the next step. You know, even over these past few years where the Browns have been 1-15 and 0-16, and and I've watched them, especially early in the season, through, through those first eight weeks, and they always have been competing. They've never been a team that just gets, you know, the floor cleaned with them. I've been looking at that Ravens injury report this week, and it looks pretty negative for them. A few linebackers out. Of course, Hayden Hurst did not practice part of this week. Um, you know, injuries might be the story on both sides. Christian Kersley, that star linebacker for the Browns, he is questionable. It, it really depends on, for me, who plays tomorrow. Well, the one thing the Browns did that's been overlooked a little bit is they do have 13 takeaways. And they've lost every game they've lost. I mean, they could have beat the Steelers Absolutely. without a you know with a field goal kicker if that guy Joseph was there. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were really robbed in Oakland last week. They sure were. But uh, I, I just think right now the, Ra- the the Ravens are on a roll. I mean, I might be talking out of turn here a little bit, but I think the Browns have definitively the best quarterback in the game too. I mean, I might be just biting. What off do you mean more. in the game? I think that Baker Mayfield today is better than Joe Flacco. I think oh, they, in that game? Yeah. Okay. You said the game. Oh, okay. <laughs> in the game that we're talking about right now for tomorrow between the Browns and the Ravens, I think that Baker Mayfield's the best quarterback on the field, and I think he's going to have a lot of success. Well, he hasn't gotten nailed by Suggs yet. He hasn't gotten nailed by no, Judon but, yet. Well, but he's going to have a lot yeah, of space. And Joku in the middle of the field is going to have a lot of space, I think, because the Ravens can't defend those, uh, those mid-length things. All right, go ahead, Mace. Well, really quick on that, Danny, I think Baker Mayfield might be the best playmaking quarterback on the field, but is he the best complete quarterback? That's yet to see. You know, Joe Flacco definitely has some of those veteran traits that Baker definitely doesn't have. I am have going like on that. a limb a little bit. You're, you're, you know, you're, 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 you're hallucinating right, <laughs> right now. Because Did you see how tight that spiral was? I, it looks like Drew Brees look, out there. Dude. Have you seen how tight Flacco's yeah, spirals true. have been? That's true. That's true. All right. His balls have been on the money. That touchdown pass to John Brown is oh. incredible. And uh, look, the Browns gave up 42 points to Oakland. I'm going to leave it there. 
We'll see what happens, but I, I, you know, we'll talk more about it tomorrow. Mace, we're out of time. Thanks for coming on, my friend. Thanks and, for having uh, me, Bruce. All right, buddy. Uh, that's it. See you on uh, tomorrow at nine o'clock. Science at Kirk presents in the nest, and went back on Wednesday for Turp Talk. All right, everybody, have a great day.